Hello, this recorded class lecture is for Thursday, November 9th, 2017. This is class number 24. Uh, just as a reminder, we'll be back to our live meetings next Tuesday, November 14th. We're going to have exam two that day in class. As I've already mentioned, you can access the equation sheet on MU Online if you want to have an early look at that to familiarize yourself with the layout. Now, the homework 6B that's due that day, uh, please submit it to MU Online before our class meeting. And just as a hint, for one of those properties, you're going to need to refer to table A3 in order to get the fluid properties of air. All right, so today's lecture is going to continue with the discussion of Chapter 6. Specifically, we're going to look at another example of a nozzle and then an application of uh, fluid momentum properties with a hovercraft. So if you have any questions from today's lecture or the homework assignment or any questions related to the announcements, please feel free to let me know. Although I'm out of town this week, I'm going to be doing my best to uh, respond to your emails. So just send me a message if anything comes up. One of these problems you've got due on Tuesday is kind of an interesting one. What it is is that there's a jet of water coming out of a nozzle, and uh, the picture doesn't necessarily make it really clear, but you've got, here's the nozzle, and then it's a free jet that's coming up. This isn't water in a pipe. It's just water spraying upward. And the initial diameter of that jet is two centimeters. And I emphasize the word initial because as the water goes up, it's losing velocity, right? Um, because uh, of gravity. So the initial velocity is known, 15 meters per second. And as it slows down, what happens to the diameter of that jet of water? It increases. So Continuity says that the flow rate that's coming out of this nozzle is the same as the flow rate up here, higher. So the Q is the same, but as the velocity decreases, that jet gets wider and wider, just to maintain continuity. I don't think that necessarily is a, like one of the critical aspects of being able to solve for the answer, but I wanted to conceptually mention that to you, that even though it's slowing down, continuity is still preserved. All right, so um, there's this, I don't know, this object, this cone-shaped object that is getting sprayed by the water. And they say that there's a wire here for stability. And that's just so that it doesn't fly off sideways. The wire doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, cause any actual force. The, uh, the 30 newtons is the force that's down. And the force that's up is the applied by the water impacting the bottom of that object. And so there's an equilibrium there. They're in balance. So where it says here, the height to which the cone will rise and then stop, if we turned on this jet and the cone was down here, it would start to go up at first because the velocity would be so fast that there would be more of a force pushing it up than the weight of the object down. So it's going to start rising and rising until it comes into that point of equilibrium, which is where the upward forces applied by the liquid to the cone are equal to the weight of the cone itself. Any questions so far? So the thing that's holding up is the, uh, the deflection of the water. And we have a mass flow in. If you draw the control volume, I hope that you're getting to the point where you can sort of see where the control volume ought to be. You'd enclose the object and enclose where the liquid is changing direction. Um, what we can assume is that the water, of course, is slowing down as it goes upward, but then by the time the water gets to this elevation, whatever it is, the velocity, the magnitude of the velocity is the same here as it is there. That the deflection itself isn't slowing down the water. Of course, the direction of the velocity has changed because of that cone and the 60 degree angle that it mentions. And so when you're substituting things into this uh, momentum equation, where it says the velocity out, you're going to need to find what component of that velocity is in the vertical plane. And then when it says velocity in, 
you can see that all of the velocity as it enters the control volume would be vertical. So you won't have to necessarily worry about the angle for the velocity in. So the, uh, the last puzzle here is how to find, the last piece of the puzzle is how to find what is the velocity up at this elevation h. And uh, just as we use that for the orifice equation, you can also use Bernoulli's equation for a situation like this, where uh, if we look at the jet of the water just as it's come out of this orifice, it's not going to have any pressure. And there's also no pressure up at the elevation h. And so the pressure head terms of the uh, Bernoulli equation will both cancel out. We know the initial velocity down at this lower elevation. We're trying to find the elevation up at z2. So you can substitute this distance h. Hold on. No, no, no. Uh, v2 is known. I'm giving you bad advice here today, guys. We're trying to find the height. The, uh, the v2, you know, based on how much velocity is required to hold up that 30 Newton object. Like um, the 30 Newtons that's listed here for the part, that, uh, that piece is 30 Newtons. And so that's the force that's down. And we know that the water is applying a 30 Newton force upward on the object. And so if you set that force equal to this, then the only unknown in the um, in the momentum equation is going to be what is the velocity of the water um, that's required to hold it up. Because the mass flow rate in and out will be the same, and the mass flow rate here at the orifice is going to be the same as the mass flow rate aloft. And so um, by substituting 30 newtons into this equation, you'll find the magnitude of the velocity. And although there is a a direction component to the outflow, the v's themselves are the same in both cases. The magnitude of the v is the same. So that will be the v2 that you substitute into the uh, Bernoulli equation. Yeah, so the only unknown is the velocity up above. Uh-huh. That's a good question. Um, now, first, I'll mention that since this is a cone-shaped object, there's not two different exit streams. There's just one continuous exit stream. So think in three dimensions what it would look like if a jet is being intercepted by a cone. You know, in the lab, uh, we saw with that first 30-degree thing, it sort of sprays the water in all directions. Um, so the magnitude of the velocity is going to be the same, and it's just one stream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's possible, but we don't know anything about whether it's non-uniform or not. Um, what we're going to assume, because we don't have any sort of a friction coefficient or a differential fraction going to the left versus to the right, just by inspection we can see it appears that it's held in the center, and that's the purpose of this wire for the stability, is to make sure that it is getting sprayed in the center of the cone. So. You just assume that the velocity out after deflection is the same as the velocity in. All right. All right. So let's uh, kick things off with some calculations to reinforce what we've been doing so far. Uh, so far, we've been keeping track of mass flows in and mass flows out. In this case, it's not water as a liquid, but it's uh, some liquid that has a specific gravity of 2. And so if it has a specific gravity of 2, of course, what that means is that when we're calculating the mass flow rate as the density times the volumetric flow rate Q, we're going to have our density equal to 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter because water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Now, this is a little bit complicated because we've got two streams coming in and two streams going out. And uh, they're numbered, just so we're on the same page of what everything is. Uh, stream one is an outflow where we've got the volumetric flow rate and the velocity. 
Stream two is an inflow. Both are defined. Stream three, we only have a velocity. So one of the things we're going to have to do in this problem is apply the continuity relationship to find out how much of the flow is coming out at three. Because all of the other streams, you'll notice that there is a Q. There is a volumetric flow rate for either it being in or out at those other three streams, but not at stream three. So that's going to be making up the balance, finding out what's the Q3. And then uh, you'll need to apply the momentum relationship here. Uh, the momentum relationship being that the force required to hold the system steady in X will be the sum of the mass flow rates out times the velocity out in X minus the sum of the mass flow rates in times the velocity in in X. So if we look at X, we have only ins. There's no outflow in X. And in Y, when we apply that same approach in the Y direction, there's only outflows, but there's no inflows in X. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is break it up into components. Find the X force required to hold the system steady and the force in Y. So since we don't know at the beginning whether the force required is going to be to the left or to the right, what we'll do is we'll just uh, write some placeholder force. We'll say, here is our f of x, and we want to find the magnitude of it required to hold the system steady. Make that a little more horizontal. All right, here's the force in x, and then here's the force in y. So let's find out how much we have to apply to hold the system steady. So the x direction just has flows in. So here's the overall formula for momentum. We're going to have in but no out for the x direction. So that's why both of these are minus here when we actually start doing the substitutions is because we're distributing the negative sign that's in the formula to the two components that are outflows. And if we look at it, we can see that uh, stream two is to the left. And so we're going to have to be careful about putting the negative sign when we do the substitution for the velocity there. So 300 kilograms per second at 60 meters per second, and then 600 kilograms per second at 30 meters per second. So the numbers tell us that it cancels out. And also, if we just kind of go back to the original picture and think about it for a second here, uh, here you've got a high velocity and a low flow rate. Here you've got a low velocity and double the flow rate. And so clearly it is going to sort of cancel each other out because um, overall momentum is just the mass flow rate times the velocity. And the, the density of both of those liquids is the same as it comes in. So there's no force required to hold the system steady in the x direction. It's just a vertical force that's going to have to be applied. So, uh, both of the mass flow rates could be calculated directly, but this stream three, the first thing that we're going to have to do is think about um, calculating that. And uh, here you can see that the mass flow rate at three is going to be um, two plus four, which are the inflows, minus stream one, which is a, the, the outflow from the top. So it's 700 kilograms per second that's coming out of the bottom. Um, And so when we have only outflows in this one and no inflow, then it's going to be zero for this right-hand term, uh, for the second part of the right-hand term. And the 200 kilograms per second is going up at 20 meters per second. The 700 kilograms per second was going down, which is why we put the negative sign in for 15 meters per second. And so the force to hold the system steady, we'll have to apply an external force that's downward, 6,500 newtons. 
And uh, that should make sense to us conceptually because if you've got a lot of water coming out of the bottom and very little coming out of the top, it's kind of like a rocket, you know? Like you've probably played with toys before where it's like a little toy rocket that has compressed water and compressed air and you push a button and it shoots out of the water out of the bottom. So this is working kind of like those jet boots in a way, you know, there's just more flow coming out of the bottom than the top. And so the tendency is going to be for this thing to be shifting upwards. And so we have to apply an external force downward to hold that system steady. Any questions about the calculations? All right. Well, let's talk about nozzles. Nozzles are a little bit different. Um, and uh, the reason why is that it's not just one external force that's being applied. There's actually another external force that's uh, in a way kind of invisible unless we think carefully about it. Um, so in this nozzle you have uh, a tapering diameter. It's originally 30 centimeters and it squeezes down to 10 centimeters. And there's a flow rate going through here so that we could calculate the velocity at both locations because remember um, Q equals VA, and so since we know the Q, and since we've got the diameter, we could find the velocities in both of those uh, sections in, at location one and location two. By the way, this is uh, very closely related to one of your homework assignments. Um, so this one, um, to hold the system steady, we would apply an external force to the flange. Now, there's just one flange here. I know it looks like there's two but it goes all the way around this pipe. It's a circular pipe. So again, we have to kind of uh, think in, think in um, three dimensions. Now there's nothing happening vertically in the y direction. There's just here something happening in the x direction. So what we want to find out is how much do we have to push in the x direction to hold that nozzle steady. But the uh, the thing that's a little bit tricky is that the water that's in this pipe, it continues to the left. Um, you know, it's not pictured, but you know, here is a pipe that keeps going, and it's just that we haven't drawn it. Here's our control volume. You know, we've got a control volume where some change is happening. It goes up through the top. I'm not going to draw on the wall, but it's as though there is a pressure acting over an area. And um, so, of course, a pressure times an area is another force. And that's what this formula is showing you here, is that the pressure inside of the pipe that's on the outside of the control volume is pushing to the right. Now, of course, there's water on the inside of the control volume that's pushing to the left. But what we're wondering about is what's external to the control volume. So when you draw a dashed line that's representing your control surface and uh, you have a pressurized pipe, then there's this pressure one times area one that's as though it's an external force. And you're also going to wonder, in addition to that, what force are you going to be applying in the x direction to that flange in order to hold the system steady? And so this component of it is kind of a new thing that you'll see anytime you cut a, an enclosed pressurized pipe with your control surfaces for a momentum problem. You have to add that component. And so here we've got a mass flow rate that we could calculate based on the volumetric flow rate. So Q is given as 0.3 cubic meters per second and it's water which allows us to know the density. And then there's also a difference in velocities. There's the, uh, the velocity that's coming out. There's the velocity that's coming in, which is going to be lower. And uh, here we can calculate the velocities just based on the uh, continuity relationship because V equals Q divided by A. All right. So, um, 
We don't know in this problem, though, what the pressure is. You'll notice that I have the little question mark there. Because we're saying we have to account for the pressure in order to find out what external force is being applied. But how can we find the pressure if it's not already known? Exactly right. Bernoulli's equation. Why does that apply here? Okay, because of continuity, right? Um, it can apply in part because if it's a jet of water that's coming out, remember that here, just outside of the nozzle, if we called that, I guess, two, then the pressure is going to be known here, whereas inside the pipe, we don't know it, um, we're going to say P1 is unknown, but P2 is zero because it's a jet of water coming out. And so, um, you know, anytime we have a change in velocity, then the Bernoulli equation is going to apply. Because if you have a change in velocity, remember, you have to have a change in pressure. So on the inside of this enclosed tapered section, there's going to be some positive pressure. We don't know what it is there, but we can apply Bernoulli's equation on the outside and say we know the velocity is the same, uh, but the pressure is zero. So to solve this, we're trying to find out the main thing that it's asking is what is the force required to hold the system steady. But before you can calculate that, you have to find out how much is that pressure that's inside the pipe. And then when you cut the pipe with your control surface, then it becomes sort of uh, another external force being applied to the momentum system. So P1A1 will be on the left-hand side of the equation, and on the right-hand side of the equation will be what's always been there, just the, uh, the difference in the mass flow rates times the velocities. These little arrows I, I drew those on separately from the figure that was provided in the book. And you won't always be given this reminder that there's some pressure you have to account for. That's something you kind of have to see in the problem and know is there that has to be accounted for. So uh, don't take the absence of those little arrows to mean that there's no pressure inside the pipe because there will be. And that's true on the homework or on the exam if it comes up. It's just this one time that I'm helping you to try and understand that that uh, pressure inside the pipe is there. I've got the answers to some of the pre preliminaries up on the screen there. The mass flow rate, the areas, the velocities. An amazing sketch. All right, so if you've gone as far as the pressure, then you see that it's uh, 720,000 newtons per meter squared. We got that from Bernoulli's equation. And then when you put it into uh, momentum, here where it says the sum of the forces in the x direction, what that means is the pressure times area force, which is external, and it's acting to the right plus some external force applied at the flange. And we don't know the direction of that necessarily. 
But this pressure times area, that has to be acting to the right because it's on the outside of our control surface pushing towards the right. If we had uh, a different type of pipe, like if it was, well, I'll, I'll show you a key idea in a moment that will address what happens if you've got pipes you're cutting in different directions. So uh, if you rearrange this just to solve for the external force that has to be applied at the flange, then you should get that it's uh, 40,000 newtons to the left. And it's kind of interesting if you think about what you usually experience when you're holding on to like a, uh, a hose, like a garden hose. Um, you know, if, if I thought about it, I would have thought the hose is pushing my hand the opposite direction that the stream is coming out, right? So what I have to, the force I have to apply is forward to get the water to go forward. But here, what this is showing is that you actually have to push to the opposite direction. So the negative sign here means that you're actually pushing to the left. And I think the, uh, the reason for that is because we have this really large pressure inside of the pipe that's pushing to the right. And also with the hose, if you think about it, the water's coming up vertically and then it changes direction towards the, uh, the out is in the horizontal direction. And so here, you've got both the flow in and the flow out are in the x direction already. So what we'd normally expect from the jets that we experience most frequently in our life, which is you know, a handheld hose with a nozzle on it, usually you have to push forward on these, but this one you have to push the opposite direction of the outgoing jet, so to the left. Everybody do all right with these calculations? Any questions about that? Now, I'll encourage you again to make it really plain what direction the force application is. So here, in my drawing at the top, I was showing that the force applied is to the right. And so the negative sign here means that it's in the opposite direction of what I had drawn at the top. And then I clarify that even more with the written text where it says that the external force that's applied has to be to the left to hold the system steady. So leave no room for ambiguity about what you think the direction of the force is. Otherwise, I'll, have, I'll be forced to assume that you didn't know. Okay, great. Let's look at some uh, key ideas for the homework. So you've got a pipe bend, and the flow is uh, continuing on both sides of this pipe bend. All we're seeing is the section that the direction is changing. And so the flow to the left, out here, has pressure that's pushing towards the right. And down here, on the outside of that pipe, is water that's pushing upward in the opposite direction of flow. And this problem's only asking for the x component of the force required to hold the system steady. And so just like with the nozzle example you just worked, um, you can find the velocity based on the diameter and the flow rate. But this problem is a little bit easier than one you just solved because you had to use Bernoulli's equation in the most recent example to find the pressure. But in this one, the pressure is defined already for you. It says that everywhere inside of this pipe section, the pressure is 300 kilopascals. So it's just a matter of the substitution into the force equation and remembering that when you cut a pipe with your control surfaces, you have to have P1, A1 as an external force. And so here, if it's, on, it's only asking you in the x direction, so that force is going to be pushing to the right. If it was asking in the vertical direction, then the external force would be pushing up because it's wherever is on the outside of the control surface, then you treat the pressure on the outside of that as acting against the, what's on the inside of the control surface. So this should be, I think, a straightforward and easy one. 
Any questions before we move on? Is the blue arrow indicating the force or the pressure? The blue arrow is indicating the flow direction. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the pressure is, oh, that's, I'm glad that you asked that, because the, uh, the pressure and the flow direction are independent of each other. Let's take this for example. What if you had a pipe section that's doing this? So the flow comes in here, and then it goes out there. And, you know, it continues. The pipe is still going, but... I'm going to solve a problem here, and so I draw my control surface, and on the inside of the control surface is the control volume. So there is a pressure that's acting here, which just happens to be in the same direction of flow, but there's also a pressure acting here, but now it's in the opposite direction of flow. It doesn't matter. The pressure is still on the outside acting in even though the flow is going towards the left. Here it's just coincidental that the flow direction is to the right and so is the pressure direction when we're talking about X. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. All right. Let's talk about landing crafts. All right. Um, I've been on an LCAC before. They're pretty amazing. They are really great. Uh, they're big. They're, they're large enough that you could have 180 troops fully loaded with all their gear on here or a tank like is shown here, a full battle tank for light armor vehicles. So they're very large and they burn loads of fuel, a thousand gallons an hour. Think about how expensive that must be to operate if you're burning a thousand gallons of fuel an hour. And we're not talking about unleaded either. These burn uh, jet fuel. And so that's like really expensive gas. Like I remember up at the Huntington Airport, just waiting for my brother to come in one time. I went over to the, uh, like they call it an FBO. It's where like the little private pilots can buy gas. And the fuel there was over $6 a gallon. Now this is back when fuel prices were a little higher than they are now, but jet fuel is expensive. And so 1,000 gallons an hour, they're probably spending like $3,000 an hour just on fuel. But you get something out of that. You get incredible speed. They go about 80 miles an hour, fully loaded with four light armor vehicles. So they're amazing. They're very large and wide, 26 meters by 14 meters, and they can carry 185,000 kilograms. Like we usually think of a coal truck of being pretty big, right? Like a coal truck is, like even if it's overloaded, maybe oh, 40,000 kilograms, right? So. This is just massive. Uh, let's watch a video of a hovercraft just to uh, see how cool they are and how they pop up onto a cushion of air. So starting off, it's a, uh, a thick piece of rubber, and then below that is a curtain of neoprene that's flexible. And um, when it's deflated, it can still float out on the ocean. But it, the, the reason why they have the cushion is because it can go so much faster when it's riding on a cushion of air than if it's actually down in the water. There's a lot less friction uh, and drag when it's riding up on the air cushion. So inside of here are these engines that not only, you can see the fans in the back here, that's for forward thrust, but then these are movable, I don't know, they're like ducted fans that they can turn around to maneuver the vehicle and to also uh, give it additional speed. So as it's turning on the engines, we'll see it pop up onto a cushion of air. And uh, this particular video, is significant because it was the first time that they used like a, a biofuel to run one of these landing crafts instead of just a pure jet fuel. <laughs>
So talk about momentum. You've got something that weighs 185,000 kilograms going 80 miles an hour. I mean, that is a lot of mass times velocity, right? A lot of energy there. Well, what we're going to do is uh, some calculations related to momentum for this hovercraft. There's a sketch. Oh, I guess I should dim the lights a little more so you can see the sketch. Some of the energy is used for forward propulsion, but a lot of the energy is used just so that it can hover. And um, what allows it to achieve forward movement is the fact that those fans that are here represented as propellers are pushing the ambient air backwards. And so in step one, I'd like you to just do a drawing that represents what's going on. Like where is the, uh, where is the force that's being resisted? Where's the cushion of air? How does it have forward movement? We're going to do some calculations here. In step two, I'm going to ask you to think about air pressure based on the, uh, the force that arises from the object's weight and the dimensions, the rectangular dimensions if you're looking down from above and so on. So um, you can work collaboratively, collaboratively on this, but it's related to the last homework problem you've got, which is uh, an airboat rather than a landing craft. But many of the same principles will apply in that problem. What's kind of amazing is how low that pressure is. You know, 4,800 newtons per meter squared, if you think of that in uh, traditional units, it's 0.7 psi. You know, for comparison's sake, your tires are like 32 psi. So it doesn't require much of a pressure differential between the air underneath that curtain and the surrounding ambient air in order to lift that load. It's part of the reason why they're able to make those so large is to distribute the, uh, the weight out over a larger area for the hovercraft. Still, um, you're having to maintain that pressure difference in spite of the fact that there's a big gap underneath the hovercraft. So all of the air is leaking out, and yet you need to have the pressure high underneath of that uh, hovercraft in order to keep it floating on top of the ground. So the momentum part of the problem is here in step three. You find the area of the uh, slipstream, which is the air coming off of the blades. And um, so we want to find the volumetric flow rate and then the mass flow rate of the air from each. And uh, so it's 1,832 kilograms per second of air. Those uh, that's really a lot of air mass that's moving around there. And it'll lead to a force from each of the blades of 275 kilonewtons. So in total, almost 550 kilo kilonewtons of force since there's two of them. Now, um, this is assuming that it's stationary. It has more thrust when it just starts moving compared to once it begins moving. Anybody see why that would be the case? Why it doesn't have as much forward thrust after it's actually in motion? It's not the friction, although that probably is, uh, is one additional thing that keeps it from accelerating faster than it does. Look at the momentum uh, equation here. So at the beginning, when it's not moving, we just have the air that's going out of our control volume. Uh, the, we, we've assumed that the velocity of the air that's coming in is zero. But once that LCAC is going 80 miles an hour, then the un incoming air has a high velocity. And so the difference in velocity between the out and the in is smaller. And so the force here, F, depends on the difference in velocities. 
And so if the, if the two velocities are closer together, then it generates less force than if the incoming air is stationary. So in terms of acceleration, you can go about 0.3 Gs. And I looked it up. A Mustang, a Ford Mustang, only does 0.56 Gs. And we think of that as like really, you know, like screaming acceleration. I guess I should replace that with the reference to what the Tesla can accelerate in, because it can accelerate even more quickly. But still, that's pretty fast for something that's 185,000 kilograms, right? Maybe the 1,000 gallons of fuel an hour makes more sense when you think about how heavy it is and how quickly it's moving and how fast it can accelerate. Any questions on that problem? So the homework problem that you have that's related to this asks you about both cases. What about when it's just starting moving and then once it is moving at a certain speed, trying to think about what force is being generated by the gases that come out of the airboat. And the key to that is just looking at the differences in the two velocities in your force equation. That's it for today. Let me remind you that when you come here on Tuesday, we're going to have a real fun time because it'll be exam two. I'll print the equation sheet for you. There's no re need for you to print that out in advance, but definitely bring your calculator that day and a pencil. And I'll see you then.